This is Wednesday, the 27th of October, 2021. Welcome to IQI, or Inconvenient Questions International. I'm your host, Gishwa Sadashivan, from Singapore. IQ is committed to fostering deeper understanding, empathy, and involvement through meaningful, informed conversations across boundaries. Awareness is the first step towards action. So today we discuss a a, a recent development that had, yet again, put the Indo-Pacific region in the spotlight. The topic is AUKUS. What and why? So what is AUKUS, spelled A-U-K-U-S? It is a trilateral security arrangement between Australia, the UK and the USA, announced two weeks ago on the 15th of October. At the launch, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison described it as, quote, a partnership where our technology, our scientists, our industry, our defence forces are all working to deliver a safe, a safer and more secure region that ultimately benefits all. At the same launch event, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said, this will be one of the most complex and technically demanding projects in the world, lasting for decades and requiring the most advanced technology. US President Joe Biden had this to say. This is about investing in our greatest source of strength, our alliances, and updating them to better meet the threats of today and tomorrow. Indeed, this effort reflects a broader trend of key European countries playing an extremely important role in the Indo-Pacific. This initiative is about making sure that each of us has the most modern capabilities and we need to maneuver and defend against rapidly evolving threats. I must say that it is significant that President Joe Biden used the word threats twice in his statement. The first major initiative of AUKUS will be to deliver at least eight nuclear-powered submarines by Australia, for Australia. It has been made clear that AUKUS is not about Australia acquiring nuclear weapons, as that will contravene the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that Australia is bound by. The plan is to build the submarines in Adelaide, Australia, in close cooperation with the UK and the USA. The final deal and details of the arrangement will be settled in the next 18 months. The submarines will be delivered over the next few decades. The US will share nuclear propulsion technology with Australia the same way it has with the UK since 1958 and 60 years ago. The UK will weigh in with its submarine building capability. So how much are the submarines going to cost Australia? It's expected to be in the region of 90 billion US dollars. So what can nuclear-powered submarines do that normal diesel-powered submarines can't? Number one, they don't require refueling. This is because they are commissioned with enough uranium fuel to last more than 30 years. Second, they can operate at high speeds for longer periods of time. And third, and very importantly, nuclear-powered submarines do not require air. That means that they can stay submerged for months, giving them better stealth capabilities. How many countries have nuclear-powered submarines? Presently, six countries. The USA leads the pack with 68 such submarines. Russia has 29. China has 12. The UK has 11. France, 8. And India has 1. Under AUKUS, Australia will be the seventh country to have nuclear-powered submarines. It will also be the first non-nuclear weapon-equipped state to do so. Observers say that AUKUS is also part of the U.S. strategic plan to win the technology competition in the Indo-Pacific region by seizing advantages in quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and cyber technology. So what was the response to the AUKUS announcement on September the 15th? France was livid because Australia had cancelled the submarine manufacturing deal worth about 65 billion U.S. dollars. The French foreign minister called it I quote, a stab in the back. China's official response was characterized as strong but measured, calling it extremely irresponsible and seriously undermining regional peace and intensifying the arms race. However, the pro-government Global Times didn't seem to pull its punches. It warned Japan, India and Australia that, quote, once they step on the red line of China's core interests, China will not hesitate to punish them, unquote. The response from ASEAN countries was somewhat muted. Malaysia expressed concern that AUKUS would, 
provoke other powers to act more aggressively in the region. Indonesia is very concerned about the continued arms race and projection of power in the region. Singapore welcomed AUKUS saying it would contribute constructively to the peace and stability of the region. Taiwan and Japan, as expected, have strongly welcomed AUKUS as visible evidence of readiness to stand up to China's assertiveness. India's response is, is inextricably linked to its own calculations as a member of the Quad. The Quad, by the way, is an alliance that was formed in 2007 based on the idea that the Indo-Pacific is a single strategic space. The four members, India, USA, Japan and Australia, have a vested interest in upholding the rules and norms of the current order. India needs to balance several long-standing and conflicting security, diplomatic and economic calculations. For example, China has overtaken the US as India's number one trading partner. India is also cautious about committing to an even greater reliance on the US as its defense partner. That being said, India would welcome initiatives that bolster a long-term strategy to contain China's influence. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi asserted that the United Nations and at the United Nations and the recent Quad Leadership Summit in the US that AUKUS, like the Quad, is aimed at pushing back unilateralism and expansionism in the region. India's external affairs minister explained India's nuanced position succinctly. He said, the more platforms you have, the more people work with each other, the larger the consensus, and that's good. AUKUS is the latest in a string of alliances the U.S. entered into in the Asia-Pacific region from 1941, when the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance was set up to monitor the Soviet Union during the Cold War. That was in 1941. The alliance comprised the USA, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Then, in early 50, 1950s, there was the famous San Francisco system, a consolidation of alliances in the Asia-Pacific region. The communist revolution in China in 1949 was a key trigger, that is, to contain communism. In 1951, there was the ANZUS Treaty, A-N-Z-U-S, between the US and Australia and New Zealand. Between 1951 and 54, the USA created a hub-and-spoke system in the Asia-Pacific theater through a string of bilateral security treaties uh, with the Philippines, with Japan, Korea, and the Republic of China, or Taiwan, as it's called. In 1955, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO, was formed to protect the inter integrity of the region. The eight members of CETO included Thailand, the Philippines, USA, UK, Australia, New Zealand, France, and Pakistan. Now, let's move on to China's actions in the region. In the last hundred years, China has engaged in several military campaigns. These include the Battle of Chando against Tibet in 1950, the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, the Tibetan Uprising of 1959, the China-Burma border campaign from 1960 to 61, the Sino-Indian War of 1962, the Sino-Soviet border conflict of 1969, the Battle of Parasol Islands in 1974, and the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979. Over the last few decades, China's Navy has rapidly expanded. As of 2019, the Chinese Navy has 335 ships making it larger than the U.S. Navy's fleet of 296 vessels. What's particularly impressive is China's shipbuilding and launching capability, the speed at which this is being done. Between 2014 and 2018, in just four years, China launched more submarines, more warships, amphibious vessels and auxiliaries than the total number of ships currently serving the individual navies of Germany, India, Spain and the U.K. However, when you compare total tonnage of the naval vessels, China's is less than half of that of the U.S. Navy. Why is this so? Well, this is primarily because of the 11 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers in the United States Navy, each displacing about 100,000 tons. Concerns that AUKUS will push China to respond with a show of force appears to already start playing out. Just a, few, a week ago, you may be aware that from the 18th of October, we saw the first joint Chinese and Russian naval exercise in the Western Pacific. A flotilla of 
10 warships completed a near circle around Japan's main island. Both countries said that it was a means of ensuring stability in a volatile region. Counteractions like these are likely to increase tension and, as feared, trigger an arms raise and an action and reaction chain. So, here are the three big questions before we start the discussion proper. Number one, who or what is the threat that President Joe Biden referred to in his launch statement? Number two, contrary to the expressed intent of delivering a safer and more re secure region, is AUKUS likely to increase tension, conflict and polarization of the Indo-Pacific? Third, President Joe Biden said that AUKUS reflects a broader trend of key European countries playing an extremely important role in the Indo-Pacific. Is this what the countries in the region desire? To help us have a more meaningful, informed discussion, we have a panel of five experts. Drew Thompson, former director for China, Taiwan and Mongolia in the office of the US Secretary of Defense. He's currently visiting He's currently the visiting senior research fellow at the, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Professor C. Raja, Raja Mohan, a former journalist and a leading commentator on India's foreign policy and regional security issues. He is currently the director of the Institute of South Asian Studies with the National University of Singapore, or NUS. Haley Channa, senior policy fellow with the Perth USA, US Asia Center. She had served with Australia's Department of Defence. Manu Bhaskaran, a leading economist and founding CEO of Centennial Asia Advisors, which provides independent research on Asian political and macroeconomic trends. Last but certainly not least, Associate Professor Hu Tiangbun, coordinator of the China program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, or RSIS. IQ International is committed to ensuring that the voices of youths from around the world are heard in each discussion. We have an international pan panel of five young people today raring to share their perspectives, hopes, and to raise questions. Grace Faber from the USA. Omkar Mane from India. Francis Oreki from Nigeria. And Louis Devine from, Divine, sorry, from Australia. And Natalie Srimpa from Greece. Let me kick off this discussion with a question for my five panel speakers. I will keep it broad. This is, this is the question. AUKUS, what's your prognosis? AUKUS, what's your prognosis? Is it a net positive or negative for the Indo-Pacific region? I'd like you to keep your, your, your uh, presentations to, five minute, to three minutes, please, so that we can keep the pace of the discussion. Uh, let's start with Drew. Thank you, Viswa. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Drew. Excellent. <clears throat> so, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, I think maybe I'll provide a little more context. Um, and I think AUKUS is obviously a trilateral agreement that's primarily about sharing technology. And I'm glad that you mentioned that it, it's not just about submarines, but includes the potential for cooperation in cyber, quantum computing, artificial intelligence. Um, and other undersea capabilities. But I think it's really important to recognize that there's a lot more going on in these relationships than just, than just the submarines. So the big context I think that's really important to remember is that the U.S. has now pulled out of Afghanistan. It's drawing down its attention to the Middle East. And that's where the U.S. And Australia and the UK and many, many coalition partners have worked together very closely militarily uh, in coalitions in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what AUKUS enables those three countries to do is actually begin to, from a security and, and diplomatic perspective as well, rebalance their security focus to Northeast Asia, uh, which I think Australia and the UK really cannot do effectively without partnering with the US and to some degree Japan as well. And it's also important to remember, particularly, I'll just give examples from Australia. I mean, Australia has significant interests in Northeast Asia, and, and there's been lots of online commentary about how a nuclear submarine gives them strategic 
uh, projection power capability. I mean, the reality is a uh, conventional submarine only gets you as far as as uh, Indonesia if you're launching from Perth. But this gives Australia the opportunity to have a strategic presence in Northeast Asia where its economic and diplomatic interests lie. Uh, I mean, Australia's second largest trading partner is Japan. The ROK is it the Republic of Korea is its third largest export market. It's also to remember that you know, Australia has had long-standing security commitments in in Northeast Asia as well. I mean, over 17,000 Australians served uh, during the Korean War and over 1,000 were, were killed and wounded. So so Australia, along with the U.S. and increasingly the, the U.K., are shifting their attention to Northeast Asia. So it's not only key for economic issues, but Northeast Asia is also home to a number of security flashpoints. You've got the East China Sea, you've got territorial disputes, uh, you've got the Korean Peninsula in North Korea. You've got Japan, Russia territorial dispute, and of course, you've got Taiwan. So, with all of these um, issues, the financial incentives, the economic incentives, the security concerns, it's really important for Australia and the UK to partner up with the US so that they can protect their interests there. And it's really, I think, also important to recognize that AUKUS is not everything in this relationship. There's extensive military cooperation between Australia and the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, Australia is a major uh, uh, operator of U.S.-made equipment. Uh, they've Over the last two years, Australia has made considerable commitments to acquire long-range uh, strike capabilities, including Tomahawk missiles, standoff missiles, anti-ship missiles, ballistic missiles, and even hypersonic missiles. So I think Australia is increasingly looking at the changing security environment. But AUKUS demonstrates a real interest in developing trust. And the AUKUS agreement enables that transfer of the most critical technology that the U.S. has, the most closely guarded technology that the U.S. and the U.K. have in its uh, submarine propulsion. So you have extensive intelligence sharing, you've got interoperability, and I can talk more about interoperability and how important that is to the militaries. Uh, and you've got now technology sharing uh, with a new agreement to support it. So this is really an evolution of an existing alliance, not a response to China or a, um, or a knee-jerk reaction to something that may have happened uh, in the past few few months, it's, it's, a, it's an evolution, and I think it's a very natural one consistent with a very deep security relationship that's been more than 100 years going strong. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Drew. Uh, let's hear from Professor Raja Mohan. Raja? You need to unmute, Raja. Yeah. So, yeah. Can Thank you hear me? You. Yes, we can hear you. No, you asked a question whether it is a net positive or a negative. Uh, that, of course, uh, depends on where you sit uh, in the in the region. Uh, but for 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 India uh, and for many others, uh, this is about enhancing regional deterrence against China. You know, it's not about containment. This is not about balance. This is about limiting uh, China's unilateral assertion of its uh, power. Therefore, any expansion of deterrent capabilities in the region would hopefully uh, begin to constrain uh, some of uh, China's attempts at changing the territorial status quo in the region. So from that perspective, uh, I think for India, which has been at the receiving end of uh, Chinese military power in the, in the Himalayas recently, and is worried about China's naval power projection into the Indian Ocean, uh, this is a, a net a positive. Uh, but I think in the rest of the region, I think there is a reluctance to see cause and effect in their in their actual form. There would be no AUKUS, now, there would be no Quad if the Chinese had not unilaterally tried to change the territorial status quo in the region, whether it's in the South China Sea, now uh, in Hong Kong, now in Taiwan, that it is Chinese actions that have produced this, this reaction. Uh, and I think uh, we are at the beginning of the cycle because all of us in the region want good relationship with China. We all want deeper economic relationship with China. But a China that sees uh, it has massive power 
super advantages over its Asian neighbors, and that it is in a position to cash in on that at this point of the time, and is willing to bet that the Americans are not going to do anything about it. That's what I think led to an overconfidence and a attempt at changing the territorial status quo in the region. Now, the Americans have reacted. Uh, a lot of the countries which have been at the receiving end of the Chinese uh, military power projection uh, would be would be happy to see some effort at uh, at uh, limiting uh, the Chinese capabilities uh, to to alter the territorial status quo in the region. Uh, a second point in the India's attitude has been that India was quite empathetic to France. Uh, so you saw one of the first things Prime Minister Modi did was to have a chat with uh, President Macron because France is a major partner of India. So from India's perspective, it would not like to see a quarrel among its friends, now that is US and France. And India would like to do what it can to work with France to strengthen French position in this part of the world and make sure we have the widest possible coalition uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, to produce a rules-based order that would limit uh, uh, the uh, the chances of the uh, unilateral assertion of power in the region. Well, thank you. Thank you, Raja. Uh, perhaps it's time for us to hear uh, China's uh, perspective. And uh, perhaps we can go to Tiang Bun, uh, Associate Professor Hu Tiang Bun. Right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Tiang Bun, we can hear you. Uh, first of all, Thank you very much, uh, Viswa, for inviting me. Thank uh, you. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I'll share what I it's uh, what I think is how China perceives uh, AUKUS, or if you will, China's prognosis of AUKUS. And I think here it's a uh, pretty obvious and straightforward, uh, as you mentioned about uh, earlier on, what is some of the official statements. Uh, I, from the Chinese perspective, it's not net negative. In fact, it's all negative. Uh, and the Chinese, they, they know that AUKUS is clearly uh, aimed at it. Uh, you know, the official broad reasoning that, uh, is that in their view, AUKUS would undermine peace and stability in the region. Uh, perhaps let me share a bit more detail of what are some of the uh, arguments and evidence that uh, Chinese analysts and scholars and their policy makers have cited to, to try to prop up this argument. Uh, a number of arguments have been made to, to substantiate this undermining of peace and stability. One, uh, it's been suggested that it will spark an arms race. Uh, in, in fact, they also uh, cite that you know some ASEAN states also make uh, you know a similar argument. Uh, it's also been cited that uh, it could escalate nuclear proliferation, proliferation risk. Uh, and here, you know, it's been you know there's been some arguments being made about how it's sort of uh, double standards in the sense uh, that you know if uh, you know of course AUKUS is not about uh, getting nuclear weapons; it's about nuclear powered submarines. But uh, you know they are making the argument that North Korea could use that as an excuse. Uh, to, to uh, basically uh, pursue its uh, proliferation uh, aims, right? Uh, you know, an argument has also been made about the it's the, the threshold in which it's easy uh, because right now it's a nuclear part submarine, but you still need to enrich uranium, right? Enrich uranium, which is actually easy to you know transfer to nuclear weapon technology. So. Uh, there are also fears of, of proliferation on that front. Uh, and another argument being cited by the Chinese is that it could undermine uh, ASEAN centrality. I think there is um, some point to that, uh, although the irony is that um, you know ASEAN states, they certainly face uh, greater pressure, greater great power pressure because of this. And ironically, I, I, I see the, the Chinese putting pressure uh, on on some states, uh, in in fact, immediately after the announcement of AUKUS, uh, the Chinese foreign minister has been making calls to a number of countries, notably Malaysia and Brunei, and you know, is trying to lobby ASEAN support uh, against uh, AUKUS, right? Uh, and you know, uh, in arguments about how ASEAN is supposedly uh, supposed to be, you know, the region itself supposed to be uh, striving for a nuclear weapon free. Uh, zone and all that. You know, these, these arguments have actually not been made by ASEAN states per se, but you know, the Chinese are sort of saying those kind of arguments on their behalf, uh, right? So, uh, in a way, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, sending the signal that, uh, you know, the region, you know, if, depending on how AUKUS develops, uh, the region can expect to face some some great power pressure over uh, this this pack, right? So I think I'll leave my comments uh, on that for now. And uh, if there's time, uh, I will, you know, I will share more on what I think are China's real concerns and its uh, likely response. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Then one very quickly, <clears throat> just out of curiosity. Sure. Did you uh, have the chance to have a conversation about this directly with any official from China? Uh, no. Uh, in fact, these days, <laughs> uh, they're actually trying to cut down on conversations with foreigners. I'm, I'm a Singaporean, so from their perspective, yeah. I'm a foreigner. So, uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's actually uh, also in part because uh, of the pandemic. But uh, a lot of the Chinese documents uh, openly cite all these arguments. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's time for us to hear the Australian perspective. Haley. Thank you so much, Viswa, and thank you very much to Inconvenient Questions International for having me. Um, if AUKUS is an inconvenient question, it's actually a very convenient answer to a lot of the problems that Australia was having in terms of procuring its submarines from France and also some of the problems that, ha uh, that Australia is having in terms of the more complex and contested regional environment that we find ourselves in. So I did want to just address the aspect of the France deal and then speak more broadly about the impact on the region. So in a nutshell, Australia now has a much better deal than what it had with France. Um, there has been a lot of discussion around the diplomatic fallout with France but in reality, this was a commercial agreement with an out clause and Australia exercised it. Uh, the deal wasn't going the way that we had hoped for. The cost blowouts had blown out by either 20 or $30 billion. And from what I hear from my um, defence industry friends, um, Australia was making a lot of requests of naval group in France that were just falling on deaf ears. So basically, France thought that the deal was too big to fail and that Australia wouldn't pull out. And it's in this context that Australia was looking for other options. And along comes the United States and the United Kingdom. The United States looking for its allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific to step up more defence spending and more security burden. And the United Kingdom looking for a way to make itself relevant again after Brexit. And also, um, I don't know that the UK is forever tied to the region, but I do know that the UK very much does like to sell its defence kit. So if there is an opportunity there, the UK was definitely going to want to be involved. So for us, it was a much better deal. Um, the problem is, though, that it's going to be more expensive and it's going to take us much longer. So where originally we were going to get um, 12 submarines, um, by about the mid-2030s. Now we're likely to get eight um, by the late 2030s, but I would say more likely the 2040s. And uh, this why you said it, it would cost around um, $50 billion or $90 billion, uh, and now we're actually looking at spending more like $120 billion. So it is the biggest defence procurement in Australia's history and certainly the biggest defence deal Australia has done since the end of World War II. Um, I wanted to echo Professor Mohan's comments about the fact that uh, if China wasn't as threatening as it is, there would be no real need for AUKUS, as well as there wouldn't be a real need for the Quad. I think that um, back in the early 2000s, China had its peaceful rise mantra, and I don't know if people remember how uh, Google's motto used to be, don't be evil, and Google decided to drop that motto. But for some reason, China has decided to drop its motto of peaceful rise. And what we're seeing now is a very belligerent China who a lot of the countries in the region are, frankly, scared of, um, whether that's its outward expression of force in terms of on the India border or in the South China Sea, or its domestic expression of force in terms of its treatment of Hong Kong and also the Uyghur people. So obviously, um, there are a lot of concerns that this great and powerful country, this dragon, is now becoming a force, a net force for, for bad in the region. Um, so with that, I think I might just hand over my comments and say, uh, this is a really good deal for Australia. And I think although concerns have been expressed by Southeast Asian nations, 
In private, their views are candidly uh, either more positive or more neutral. Um, and in fact, the main countries that have a problem with it are Malaysia and Indonesia, but not the defence departments of those countries. It's actually the foreign ministries of those countries that have a real concern. Um, you know, quietly, Southeast Asia is is pleased that this is happening. And from Australia's perspective, it demonstrates to the United States, our main ally, that Australia is serious about its future in the region as a um, strategic balancer against China. Thank you, Haley. Manu? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. So, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with uh, IQ International and to be on this panel with uh, several of my very dear and uh, very uh, uh, respected friends on the panel. I tend to look at this uh, issue uh, from the perspective of a citizen of a small and not very powerful country in Asia. And my priors are first that um, the US and China are probably going to be in a long period of contestation. And a lot of that pushing and shoving that we will see is going to unfold in our backyard in East and Southeast Asia. I also take it as a given that any large power, uh, if unconstrained, will want to lord it over the smaller nations around it. And that's not just a criticism of China, it is a criticism of any big power, right? Um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, I would argue that uh, for the small countries of this region, AUKUS is probably a net positive. I think it's a strong positive. Why do I say that? Well, I think a balance of power is always better than having one large power dominate a region. In the last few years, as some of my panelists' friends here have pointed out, China has um, undertaken some actions that have altered the balance of power and, and in fact, substantially altered the strategic position of, um, of the countries in the region. So by occupying and militarizing those what used to be rock formations in the South China Sea and are now highly militarized islands, China can project military power right in the, into the heart of Southeast Asia. Countries like Indonesia that thought that China was relatively far away now cannot make that assumption anymore. So the whole uh, position has changed and it is of great consternation to the countries in the region that this has happened. Don't forget that some of the countries in this region, not Singapore, but certainly Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Brunei have territorial disputes with the Chinese. So in that kind of context, I think a balance of power where uh, a large and intimidating power that is increasingly assertive and increasingly very powerful is balanced by another set of powers so that it's freedom to operate um, against the smaller countries, to intimidate them, to pressure them to take certain positions that they'd rather not take. I think that balance of power is always better for us. Of course, ideally, we don't want any big power in the region, but that's not a luxury that we have. So a balance of power is good. Secondly, um, I think we're in a better uh, strategic position because when two big powers are trying to um, balance each other, they need allies and they will be friendly to the uh, other small countries. Is it a coincidence that within two days of the announcement of AUKUS, China expedited its uh, application to join the CPTPP, right? And I would say that China being part of the CPTPP eventually would be a net positive for the entire region. And I'm sure, as we can see with President Biden's um, presence at the ASEAN summit and uh, Mr. Li Keqiang's uh, proposals that were, just came out yesterday uh, on what China could do to help the region, you can see that they are competing with each other to gain favor from the smaller countries. So we, the smaller countries, are in a better position as a result. So that's my view. I think it's clearly going to be a net positive. Uh, ideally, it would be preferable if we never had to worry about big powers, building military bases, um, and operating nuclear submarines in our vicinity. But we don't have that uh, luxury, and we have to deal with the world as it is. So let me stop here and turn it back to Victor. Yeah, thank you, Manu. Uh, just a quick question for the panel, right? A follow-up question. 
Uh, it's interesting, I'm sure we all know that, um, uh, and it's also not uh, unexpected that there was a virtual US ASEAN summit convened yesterday, just yesterday on the 26th of October. It's, uh, it's significant that President Joe Biden himself attended it. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong said that, um, that Singapore welcomes the US assurances that AUKUS will support, and I quote, will support ASEAN centrality. Now, what is this? What is the expectation here uh, when you say support and respect ASEAN centrality? Anyone from the panel? I'll jump in there. Um, yes, please. Uh, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Yes, the whole idea of um, ASEAN centrality, I feel as though anything that's not involving ASEAN could be accused of undermining ASEAN centrality as the Quad has been accused and there's a, a saying in Australia sometimes when when we don't like something or we don't like what somebody is doing in Australia, we call them un-Australian. And it's been used as a catch-all phrase for something that we don't like, although we can't really explain or put our finger on what it is that we don't like about it. And sometimes I feel as though using uh, this idea of undermining ASEAN centrality is sometimes used in that regard as if anything that doesn't include ASEAN is then deliberately undermining it. And I don't feel that um, defence deals that ha get done in the region or other strategic groupings are uh, set out to undermine ASEAN at all. And, in fact, I really like the way that these groupings can actually set a fire under ASEAN countries to improve and re reinvigorate their own uh, framework so that they make their own ASEAN forums um, a more compelling uh, forum and more enticing for people to get involved with. Um, and lastly, if I can just also respond to some of the comments that were mentioned before about China's reaction. Obviously, China was never going to like this announcement, uh, but I think that the the case that is made that it's somehow undermining um, nuclear non-proliferation regimes is a bit of a stretch. The uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty explicitly allows for dealing in naval propulsion systems. So there is no formal treaty problem. And if we were going to take the highly enriched uranium out of these nuclear submarines um, and fashion a nuclear weapon, well, then you wouldn't have any working nuclear submarines. Um, there are much easier ways to make nuclear weapons if you wanted to get nuclear weapons. So I don't buy into that debate um, or the fact that it's undermining ASEAN centrality. Can I uh, jump in? Uh, yes, sure. please, Palo. Yeah, um, as a citizen of an ASEAN country, of course, I would love to see ASEAN as the major platform around which other powers configure their various alliances and so on. Uh, that would give us a greater say in what goes on and a greater sense of protection. However, I do accept the reality that ASEAN has not quite got its act together. We can say as much as we like, uh, we talk as much as we like about centrality, but if we don't, don't have the fundamentals that underpin that centrality, i.e. a certain degree of economic clout, a certain degree of military posture and so on, then we do not have the right to, to demand that centrality. However, I think I, I would like to say that there are advantages to ASEAN as a platform. Uh, the ASEAN, uh, the various ASEAN summit meetings, the various uh, other... The regional uh, forum the regional forum, uh, the ASEAN Defence Ministers uh, Meeting Plus, all these things are very useful uh, for the other big powers. And, and that usefulness is seen in the fact that they actually bothered to turn up and um, participate uh, actively in those um, uh, uh, forums. So, so ASEAN has its um, uh, role. It may not be as central as it desires, but I think uh, it is a good thing that ASEAN provides uh, the region with. If I might add, if I might yes, add, yes, add, yes, please, Roger. No, I think I just want to give some context to the 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 framing of ASEAN centrality. Now, if we go back to the sixties uh, when ASEAN was formed, uh, that you had a situation where China was a revolutionary state trying to undermine the region. Uh, India had turned inwards. Japan was constitutionally constrained. So, in that context, where ASEAN tried to create a regional organization uh, centered around itself. And 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 uh, it was relatively successful at the point. And by the time the Cold War ended, the ASEAN centrality and the value of its platform were premised on two facts. One, there was globalization and regional integration taking place, and ASEAN could facilitate, accelerate the process. Second, there was harmony among the major powers. There was no contestation. US and China were buddies. 
Japan and China were buddies. The Russians were not really a factor. So everyone was getting along with everyone happily. Therefore, it was nice to have ASEAN uh, facilitate uh, a regional dynamic. But once China became very powerful, far more powerful than the biggest countries in its neighborhood, that is China and in, uh, Japan and India, and it began to assert itself, the framework in which ASEAN centrality would work was disrupted by Chinese on, or China's uh, you know, assertive activities. And therefore, other powers are going to react to it. And what they're doing today is to reassure ASEAN, look, what they're doing, whether it's Quad or AUKUS, is not directed against uh, ASEAN, and that it's about balancing China. And that doing so actually helps ASEAN because ASEAN does not want to confront China. I mean, it can, we can fully understand why ASEAN cannot take the front foot and call Chinese aggression uh, in South China Sea, and given the scale of the, the power imbalance that exists. So I think whether it's AUKUS or the Quad, are going to help ASEAN by creating complementary structures uh, which would help ASEAN uh, retain its, its importance in the region. And, and the fact is, it all boils down to China's rise uh, was not in itself a destabilizing factor, but it is China's assertion and its territorial uh, desire to change the territorial disposition uh, in the region uh, is what is destabilizing, and I think the reactions are inevitable. If I might just want to add, I mean, I spent a lifetime doing non-proliferation research, but I would fully support Haley's position. Look, I think the Chinese are just jumping on this bandwagon. Oh, God, this is a threat to non-proliferation. No, non nothing of the sort. In fact, enriched uranium, you know, in the reactors that uh, America has plans to build for, for Australia, you don't have to pull out the enriched uranium. So there is no danger of uranium being pulled out uh, and refueled in case of the, if it was French reactors, for example you would have to constantly replenish the uranium, which is low-enriched uranium. So highly enriched uranium is actually less prone to proliferation than low-enriched uranium. And in any case, the Americans are giving it in a black box. They'll take it back as a black box. So there is really no danger of uh, proliferation uh, uh, in the, uh, with the, with the, with the AUKUS uh, right. deal as it's been researched. So, so I have a quick question to... to do you think that ASEAN, given its centrality in terms of location and its relationship with uh, both China and the US and, and Europe, can play an interlocutory role where, I don't where fissures it, happen? Maybe I'll leave it to Manu, but look, I don't think today anybody can do that interlocutory role. Yes. These two are big guys, they have to sort it out themselves. Uh, the question for smaller actors like all of us is to protect our own interests. And uh, as uh, Manu and others said, uh, the competition actually gives opportunities for us to leverage our position rather than try to pretend we can somehow solve the problems between US and China. Uh, that has to be dealt directly. And more, probably, more importantly for us, it's not a problem between US and China. It's a problem between China and us. But China is so powerful today that it can do things without fear of uh, retaliation from any one of us. That is the problem. And the U.S. is simply stepping into the breach and trying to balance. So for us, we need to focus on encouraging the Chinese to go back to Deng Xiaoping's policy, put aside territorial disputes, let's focus on economic cooperation and regional integration rather than uh, using its power to change territorial status. And I think that's where we need to put in our collective effort to persuade the Chinese. What they've done is, as, is backfiring, but right. it's in their own interest to reverse course. So I'd like to ask very quickly, Kyangbun, uh, you've been quite quiet. Do you think that there's a possibility that China may realize uh, that there's pressure and uh, instead of reacting, that China would be induced to respond? Right. Uh, great question. I, I agree with uh, all the comments being made uh, by Haley and uh, Professor Mohan. Uh, regarding uh, China's uh, more assertive nature, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm not betting, certainly not betting my house on on them changing their ways uh, anytime soon in the future. Uh, you know, certainly it'd be good uh, for them to go back. Uh, you know, to you know back then when uh, Deng Xiaoping was in power, they they had this uh, keeping a low profile kind of a strategic dictum, and in fact that uh, that uh, external posture. Uh, was also con uh, more or less roughly continued during the time of Jiang Zemin and also for Hu Jintao as well. Uh, my point being that uh, the rise of uh, C uh, sort of changed this uh, picture uh, 
quite considerably. How? Uh, How did it change? What uh, is the what is the distinctive difference between Xi Jinping and Deng Xiaoping? Good question. Well, I, I think it's uh, it's quite evident that one, even in terms of like uh, domestically, uh, it's quite clear that he's breaking all the kinds of norms in terms of uh, you know political secession and and all that. Uh, in fact. Uh, you know, most observers of China uh, believe that you know he's you know the next year would be the party congress, the twentieth party congress, uh, and he's more uh, more likely or not uh, would uh, assume an unprecedented third term, right? Uh, so you know, uh, basically undermining and overturning all the political secession and a form of intra party, a limited form of intra party democracy that existed during the time of. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, where they had different factions to balance off uh, each other. But uh, uh, right now, you, you, you have a guy whose thought is actually written in the party constitution, right? Uh, and in fact, the, the way they describe him in China today is about how he is at the core uh, of the party. Uh, so it's it's clearly uh, going back, uh, you know, not necessarily to the days of Mao, but you know, there's there's a lot of uh, this this uh, cult of personality kind of politics uh, going on. Uh, so in short, he, he you know, if you can trace and link, uh, you know, the the, the sources of uh, China's assertiveness uh, is is uh, complex and multiple, right? Uh, and I don't think you can really just pinpoint and say that it's uh, Xi Jinping per se. But I would say that his rise and his leadership is is uh, one factor which we cannot ignore. Uh, and uh, going on to the future, we assume that he's going to hang around. Uh, it's it's he's, it's likely that, that China will continue to, to behave in, in, in such a manner. In fact, uh, today we talk about China's move over diplomacy. You have, you know, the senior diplomats, people like Yang Jiezi, uh, Wang Yi themselves. They don't behave this way. You know, they, these are career diplomats. If you track how they behave and how Chinese diplomats speak during the time of Hu Jintao, that's not their normal behavior. But these days, they are, you know, uh, not even assertive. It, it's almost abrasive. Right uh, and you know uh, rude even right uh, we saw what happened uh, at Anchorage and the kinds of things uh, which even the most senior diplomat uh, himself uh, Yang Jiezi uh, has has you know has said so all this you know is basically you know of course it's it's you know uh, domestically it's good for nationalism it's uh, it's popular for for these diplomats but uh, the fact that these kind of behavior uh, can get away. Uh, it, it shows that it's uh, quite direct endorsement from the man himself, from the number one man. Right. Which, see, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's can, I, uh, can I yes. say something, Michelle? Yes. No, quick one. Yeah, just a quick one. I, I think it all comes back to fundamentals. Why did China change? China changed because in 2008, it looked at how the Western world shot itself in the feet uh, through its financial crisis and how... China itself managed the crisis so well and the others didn't. And it got the sense that the West was in decline. And all the events that came after that, including the election of Trump and all that, and the, the more recent uh, mismanagement of the pandemic, just convinced them that they are on the rise and the West is in decline. And therefore, that gave them strategic opportunities. And why not exploit those strategic opportunities? Within the region, the region, ASEAN has weakened. It's more divided now. There's no clear, strong leadership. And many countries in ASEAN are prepared to go with uh, China because they feel the gravitational pull uh, of China and Cambodia, Laos, even Thailand to that extent. So again, right. it, it gave China these op opportunities. Right Now, if we change that, if the U.S. strengthens itself and shows China that it is no pushover, it is not in a state of decline, if ASEAN becomes more united and coherent, uh, then China would adjust and change its behavior. Right. Thank you. Yeah, quick work. Yeah, quick yes. one. I wanna, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, or Ricky. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in, in respect of China, I, um, I, I think uh, um, China is losing a, a lot of relationship with other regions, you know, in respect to, because other regions are really, you know, afraid of what... Um, you know, you know what could what could prompt up or what could trump up. Because I could remember the last, um, you know, during the COVID, the pandemic, even the former president of America was referring China as uh, you know the cause of the pandemic and all that. So what I'm trying to say is, um, China. I think China should you know have to have a trace back you know probably from their leadership skills and all that 
what could really be, you know, making them to lose a lot of relationship because everybody knows China has a very, you know, nice um, region and all that. So, but if they continue to lose relationship, like Australia, in the last um, event that I just saw that occurred, I think Australia had, um, you know, in the past had a very good relationship with China, but recently they are really having issues with China again and all that. So I think they really have to, you know, look at what's what is going on and what's making them to lose a lot of relationship. So, you know, from, um, from that's what I'm trying to say. You're Thank from you. you're from Nigeria, right? What's uh, yeah, and, and China China has a very strong presence in Africa. Uh, exactly. What is what what is the perception of China uh, and China's actions uh, in in that part of the world? Come again, I didn't get that. Sorry. What, what's the perception? How 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 do the Africans? Uh, I I know they are different countries, but could you give us a better sense of of how China is perceived in in Africa, in the, in the by the various African countries, Nigeria, well, for example. Basically. Yeah, for Nigeria example, I know um, I know our leadership, like our government, there's so much believe in China because of um, maybe because of the currency, because of the you know, know you guys, uh, you know, lenders and all that. So there's so much believe in your people and all that. And we have a very good uh, business relationship with China and all that. But what I'm trying to say, but to me personally, you know, in terms of you know my own perceptions and view, um, I think I think we, we we really have a good um, deal with China and. I would want to also. I would want to also use this medium to, you know, um, um, speak on this. Like currently, we are really having a very serious um, security issues in Nigeria, and you know, in terms of the Boko Haram's and all that. So I think it's a good thing if AUKUS, you know, should really look deep down, you know, on how they can leverage or rather bring bring in this technology aspect or rather platform to Nigeria, you know, to save us from this. Um, you know, security, you know, issues that we really have in this country and all that. That's so. a that's an interesting pitch, my friend. Thank you very much. I shall. Yeah, uh, I I hope the the powers that be are listening to this. Uh, let let me let me ask uh, Grace. Grace, um, you you're a student. Are uh, you doing some work in um, in Tai in Taiwan? Aren't you? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what's what's your perspective? Or do you have any questions as a young person? Absolutely. Well, I think um, Mr. Thompson's point that from the um, perspective of the U.S., the AUKUS really demonstrates that commitment to developing trust. I think that's something that has been enunciated in in Taiwan's response to AUKUS. Um, the Taiwanese government's response to the pact has been recognizing that it's a positive and necessary trend toward peace and stability in the region. And the, through AUKUS, um, from the lens of countries within the the Indo-Pacific region like Taiwan, these countries are really seeing President Joe Biden as well as um, the UK and Australia really demonstrating with with real actions their commitment to to their Indo-Pacific strategy and to bringing these wider security benefits to the region like like countries um, such as Taiwan. Do, would, would you say that the Taiwanese are uh concerned about possible repercussions as a result of this uh in in other words from from china so far i haven't seen anything like that i think from the taiwanese perspective the AUKUS pact is is seen more as a deterrence mechanism and that the presence of these nuclear submarines um, within the region will serve as a deterrence to China and really demonstrate to China that if it were to use force against um, Taiwan, it would be greatly constrained by that um, first island chain with, with Australia and having the presence of U.S. and um, and UK intelligence and materials and technology within that region, it, it acts as that great deterrence mechanism. So that's been um, more of a, a, a protecting um, yeah. force for Taiwan. Right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else among the youth panel? Louis from uh, Louis Devine from uh, Australia. Yes. Um... I'm afraid I'm going to have to be the odd one out in this discussion and, and say that uh, I, I don't think AUKUS is a good deal for Australia. 
for a number of reasons. Um, to contextualise my remarks, uh, I want to point out that historically speaking, there are two broad schools of thought in Australian defence policy, to be overly simplistic. Uh, defence of Australia, which was dominant in the 1980s under the Hawke government and forward defence. Defence of Australia does what it says on the box. Australia should basically focus on protecting its mainland and the air sea gap in the north where any attack would come from. Whereas forward defence argues that Australia's security is tied up with the broader global balance of power and therefore Australia should intervene abroad to basically ensure a favourable balance of power to its own interests, which in practice has meant first supporting Britain and second supporting the United States. Now, as has been pointed out by a number of speakers, the key benefit of nuclear submarines is their ability to go uh, for longer and for further farther away because they don't need to resurface because of the way that they're fueled. So that suggests in terms of capabilities that we're moving away from defence of Australia back towards a forward defence policy, which raises the question in my mind, to whom against are we projecting power? Um, presumably it, it, it would be China. And that, I believe, answers the question that was first laid out at the beginning of this talk. Who is the threat that Joe Biden referred to? It seems to me pretty clear that the threat to China and I, I do not think that, that China is, is a strategic threat to Australia. I, I think the most persuasive analysis on this issue has been put forward by Australia's former ambassador to China, uh, uh, Joff Raby, who argued that China is not going to have a violent warlike path to regional hegemony as the United States did, because China is a constrained superpower. It's constrained by Japan, by Russia, by India. So this, I think, is, is Australia uh, basically exaggerating the threat that it faces from China. I just want to speak briefly, if I may, on some of the technical problems with the deal as well. As Haley pointed out, um, under AUKUS, we're not, we're not scheduled to see these submarines until the 2040s, which means we're going to have to keep retrofitting current Poland-class submarines until the late 2040s. These were built in the 1980s, we only have six of them. I believe there are only three in the water at any one time because of how old they are. And I also believe that we need French assistance in retrofitting them. Um, so we haven't really thought this through and we're going to have a massive capability gap, especially okay. in the 2030s. So I hear you, uh, Louis. I think, I, uh, I think you've made your point. The earlier point is very interesting. Um, I'd like to put your, your point to Drew. Drew, you, you had said clearly uh, at the start that AUKUS is not about China. It's not about, you know, a, a, a project that is anti-Chinese per se. Uh, but, but what exactly are the threats that uh, President Joe Biden referred to in his statement at the launch of, uh, of AUKUS? What exactly, I mean, if not for China, if not China, what are these threats that he was referring to? So I think the, the, the key here is, you know, AUKUS is not just about submarines. Um, it's about deepening cooperation and integration between the U.S. and Australia and the U.K. So that's number one. Uh, the threats, and I think we've been pretty clear uh, that, you know, China is presenting the threat to the region, both in terms of its its, its gravity, its size, its military modernization, the pace and scope of which is, is just tremendous, um, as you pointed out in the beginning. I mean, it, it, it builds a new national navy every year So, uh, for, for, compared to a small country. So the issue is, is it's not that Australia is directly threatened. The PLA is not planning an invasion of Darwin. The China has not ruled out and has threatened to use force to solve its territorial disputes with Taiwan, with Japan. Um, you have other potential threats to Japan, uh, including Russia. Uh, and then, of course, you have North Korea. So you have flashpoints in Northeast Asia and Australia has interest there. And, and this gets back to Raj's very first point. It's really about deterring China from thinking that it can use force against anyone on its periphery and succeed. And 
it's not about containing China. It's about making sure that Xi Jinping doesn't make the decision to use the PLA to solve a political or a policy problem. And what Australia is doing is contributing to that deterrence effort. And I'll make one, one last point here, and this is where, where ASEAN centrality comes in. Um, I mean, ASEAN has demonstrated the ability to benefit from great power competition historically for many years and and good on them for, for doing so. But But part of what the U.S. is going to be looking for is what other countries can do to deter China from using force. And I think if you look at the... Um, the, the statements that just came out of this most recent ASEAN meeting, you know, the, it's, it's heavy on the language that reminds China to follow existing rules and norms and not threaten to use force to settle disputes. And that's where Xi Jinping, I think, has really changed people's calculus because he has increased the threat and he has made threatening statements. And that's the response that Ultimately, Southeast Asian states are going to have to decide, are their foreign policies going to be defined by what they will not do, whether that's choosing sides or, um, or taking an active stance, or you know, are they going to figure out that, that they're going to have to take some measures to actually contribute to stability and deter the use of force and not just sit on the sidelines and wait for what may come? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Um, Haley, would you want to respond to Louis' points? Uh, in particular, I'd like to ask you to respond to the point that it'll take a, it'll take a long time before the uh, nuclear-powered submarines are ready. And in the meantime, how, how do you see Australia actually, um, you know, deploying itself to, to achieve the mission of, yeah. uh, of security in the region? Yeah, well, thank you very much to my Australian colleague. If we were buying French submarines, I would call him Louis. But because we're buying American, I'm going to call him Louis um, <laughs> and say that, um, you know, I was very surprised to hear him say that uh, China is not a strategic threat to Australia and delighted to hear him say that because I love hearing the other side of the coin. You know, a pancake's got two sides. I want to hear the other side of it. Um and I would, I would argue against that because even if you're not thinking about the military threat that China presents, China has presented a very big geostrategic threat and um, geopolitical threat in terms of uh, its economic trade war with Australia, in terms of um, its anti-dumping measures, and um, also in terms of its cyber attacks, which have been attributed um, by the defence and foreign ministers to China earlier this year. So I think on a couple of fronts, China is presenting a strategic threat. But yes, to answer his uh, very good point about the fact that these submarines will take longer, look, the French submarines were going to take a really long time too. And no matter what we do, there's going to be a capability gap. Um, what we're trying to do to bridge that gap was this this theory that we could lease um, American or UK submarines. Now, in reality, that is actually not an option because um, the US doesn't have the number of submarines that it wants for its own force and likewise with the United Kingdom. Uh, one thing, one solution has been put to me that instead of building these submarines in Australia at Australian shipyards, which is very politically important for this government, this government which is facing um, a federal election in probably March next year, and job creation is a big deal, um, instead of doing that, we could accept that we really need to get these submarines faster to bridge that capability gap. And with the United Kingdom, for instance, which is building its astute class, once the UK has built the six submarines that it wants, instead of us creating a new shipbuilding industry here, we could offer to buy the UK's seventh and eighth off of that production line and get sub submarines faster. But basically, no matter which way you crumble this cookie, um, there's going to be a capability gap. Uh, but we're only a few years behind where we were with the French deal and the Collins class life of type extension um, was always going to be needed. So in the meantime, to bridge that capability gap, we're looking at other things like the long-range fires, the Tomahawk missiles that we've also agreed under AUKUS, and some of the other things that we haven't talked about very much about AUKUS, like um, the quantum and AI and using unmanned um, 
unmanned uh, underwater drones. So there are other things that we are looking at to, to bridge the capability gap. Just out of curiosity, Haley, um, how exactly does Australia or the, the Alliance uh, plan to deploy, strategically deploy, the submarines once you procure them? Which part of the region are these submarines going to be going to be located? Well, this one, that's why we have submarines. We don't want to tell you where we're going to place them. <laughs> um, but like we said before, uh, with the conventional submarines, they couldn't take us much beyond Indonesia. And the, the purpose of submarines is not only um, for deterrence, they're also able to loiter, they're able to monitor ship movements. This doesn't just have to be China, it could be Russian ship movements, um, it could be North Korean ship movements. Um, it doesn't have to be all directed at China. And what that means too is that with a few more Australian submarines um, under undersea, it can also force other vessels to come off task, whether that's in the South China Sea or wherever, um, to monitor the submarine's movement. So you're actually drawing some forces away from contested areas. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a question from someone in the audience by the name of Chaotic Genges. You want to speak, please? Unmute and speak. Hello? Mr. or Ms. Chaotic Genjis? No? Change your mind? Yeah, uh, Vesua, can I, can I just uh, chip in at this point? Yes, yes, please. Uh, just to uh, augment a point uh, early on uh, about Taiwan. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, early on I had, I had sort of uh, elaborated on uh, some of the, if you will, official Chinese arguments uh, or, you know, the, the official uh chinese counter arguments against AUKUS, uh but uh, you know but i i do think that you know their real concern uh is relating to uh taiwan and of course uh as part of that uh, as well as the other territorial claims in the south china sea as well as in the east china sea well it basically means that it makes it you know there's this uh you know i'm not saying that australia uh, would be involved but there's this prospect of uh, its involvement and and this uh, you know the Chinese are assuming the worst case scenario that it will make it more difficult for them uh, to claim back Taiwan in, in the event of uh, the use of force. Uh, so certainly from that point of view, uh, because Taiwan is is something which uh, what they call their their most most important of core interests in, in their view. So this uh, so from that perspective, uh, that's that's uh, you know. Uh, their fear. Number two, um, I also think that there's this, you know, when they talk about arms race, there's this, uh, you know, whether it's uh, founded or unfounded fear, uh, they, there's this, uh, they fear this prospect of Japan or even South Korea uh, following the example uh, of Australia and, and, you know, to, to have uh, also nuclear powered submarines, which, uh, you know, would, would alter the, the regional balance of power in Northeast Asia. Uh, especially if, if, you know, if the U.S. gives the go-ahead and Japan decides to do something similar, uh, you know, this, this would, uh, uh, in the Chinese view, affect their uh, security interests. So, Tian Bun, uh, here's a question, right? That, sure. That there appears to be growing concern, right, that China, I mean, we, we, we're expecting China to behave rationally or to respond mm -hmm. rationally. Uh, China could, could react instead mm -hmm. by saying, you know, just as what you do to to someone who, when you push him against the wall, you know, the person could give up or the person could punch back. Um, options get limited when, 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 when there's perceived aggression. Now, how is this likely to affect China's stance uh, in the region in particular with countries it has, it has ongoing disputes with, like, like Taiwan or for that matter Japan? Um, uh, or, or, or even Philippines, you know, where, where there are disputes going on. Is there a possibility that, that whatever is going on right now could push them to the brink and make them uh, react strongly? Um, so far, if you notice the trend and pattern of Chinese behavior, has been they would up the ante, right? Uh, you know, and the, you know the situation is there's a security dilemma. You know, uh, you know what the other side perceives to be enhancing its deterrence is perceived 
by the Chinese to be drastically reducing its uh, security, rightly or wrongly, right? And its response, uh, you know, a rational response would be, you know, if you will, to, to maybe hold back and maybe at least have a reflexive, uh, you know, uh, you know, thinking about why, you know, states are pushing it back, uh, pushing back against its its assertive behavior. Uh, but its behavior has been, has been actually to take the opposite route so far as is basically to, to actually up the ante and to highlight its displeasure even more, uh, at least visibly. Uh, and the way I look how the Chinese would response uh, is that they would do all things short of you know, it, it's a way of creeping aggression. You know, it's it's not like they would, you know, op, you know, very overt measures. You know, sort of launching missiles and things like that. They won't. There's no there's no reason for them to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, but what they do is that they will, they will, you know, have more military patrol. Uh, you know, in the case of Taiwan, they've been sending more planes. So what? Such, such yes, yes, what? Yes, right? yeah. Costume, precisely. Right. Okay, uh, a, question, a quick question for Manu. Can I um, weigh in quickly on, on, on that comment? Yes, I yes, think, true. I yes, think that's the, whole, that's the whole purpose. I mean, what, what, what Professor Kimboon has Ooh, described yeah. is, mm-hmm. is success. Um, it basically, taking away China's options by making it so uncertain that they'd be successful from using force that their only options are political and gray zone coercion with you know below the the threshold of the use of force below the threshold of war to solve their disputes i think that's what everybody wants and that's what these in, these these efforts are intended to achieve is to make it so uncertain that china would achieve what it wants from using its military that it will it will embargo taiwanese pineapples so can i, can I follow australian up, uh, exports yeah. Can yes, I follow up yes, on, on that? Go ahead. Can I, can I follow up on that? Yes. yes. So Drew uh, and, and Jiang Boon, would you say that a strengthened U.S. alliance, a clear signal from the U.S. that it is going to be engaged for a very long time in this region, it's not going to go away, would deter China from an aggressive move on Taiwan, whether that aggressive move is seizure of the Pratas offshore islands or, or something even more decisive later on in the decade? Do you think that AUKUS not the nuclear submarines, but the signaling effect of the U.S. being stronger, having more allies, and being determined to remain in this uh, region reduces the risk of an adventure against Taiwan. Right. I think it affects Beijing's decision-making cycle, and they're less certain of success. I mean, China can take Kinmen Island tomorrow, um, and that would be devas- I mean, that would be devastating for Taiwan. But it wouldn't be an existential threat. It would present real problems. So, 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 yeah. I mean, China still has lots of options, whether it's uh, trade embargoes or more coercion, maritime militia, uh, taking hostages. All these things below the threshold of war. But what deters that from escalating is unity of opposition, uh, the sense that. That China maybe will 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 say face from doing something to respond, but but not something they can't get back out of. So again, they may take hostages, but eventually they'll release them. Um, so that's the whole purpose is to to basically constrain China's choices so that their only choices are to negotiate to make itself more attractive to Taiwan for unification, which is a very difficult thing to think about right now. But in the long term future, as you're discussing, you know, it's possible that China is different in the next era after Xi Jinping passes and and the people of Taiwan want to reunify with China, as they call it. And, And that's up to China. Um, and and how they position themselves as a partner for other countries. But right now, that's not the case. So the best option is to strengthen relationships and strengthen resolve, build up the military capability that creates enough doubt that when I worked at the Pentagon, we had a sign hanging over the Taiwan desk. It simply said, not today. The, we don't have to deter China for decades. We just have to deter them today. From using force, and if we deter them today and tomorrow and the day after and every day after that, we've achieved our goal. So, so that was the mantra, and that was our our, our slogan: not today. And that's what this is intended to do. 
So, so it's a long-term effort, but it's a daily endeavor. Can we? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, a very good question. I think there are two levels to this question. Uh, you know, if greater American signaling from a regional basis, particularly from ASEAN's perspective, uh, to show greater commitment, greater involvement would be good. Uh, you know, it's it's no coincidence that you know after you know Biden showed up, even if virtually, you know, I, I look at how uh, you know Lee Keqiang of course turned up, uh, and you know he he's, he's you know the key takeaway is that he urged expedited negotiations on the South China Sea COC, right? So, uh, you know, your earlier point about uh, greater competition for ASEAN states, uh, you know, goodwill and favour, I think that aspect is, is true. But on the Taiwan situation, specific to the Taiwan case, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, right now, I think there's a debate going on in Washington whether or not, you know, maybe the US should change its policy or strategic ability to strategic clarity, right? So if, you know, and I think recently, you know, Biden has made some comments about, you know, uh, you know, yes, the U.S. would defend uh, Taiwan, and, and later on, the White House would say that no, there's no change uh, in their policy and all that. Uh, my view that is this would be, in, in the view of the Chinese, a unilateral change in the uh, as in, you know, if the the Americans make an explicit commitment uh, to defend. Uh, Taiwan, uh, and that would be strategic clarity, and they may actually take preemptive uh, measures. And you know, as as uh, uh, Drew was mentioning, uh, you know, they are not going to. I don't think they are going to invade uh, Taiwan un unless you know, you know, Taiwan explicitly declares independence, which is not going to do at uh, at any point in time. So, but they may uh, want to to do some of these, you know, um, visible or symbolic victories, like uh, snatching back. Uh, Kinmen Island and all, all the kind of things because the problem with, with Taiwan at least from the Chinese calculus it's no longer rational it's about it's linked to the political legitimacy of the Chinese leader no Chinese leader in, in, in China today and that especially for someone like Xi Jinping right uh, who's so nationalistic and is still in the stage of consolidating power can afford to be seen as the guy who lost Taiwan right so, uh, you know, it will directly affect the political legitimacy of any Chinese leader if they are being sort of being seen as, you know, you know, this is the guy who lost Taiwan. And, you know, he'd be, you know, the narrative would be, you know, he's, he's, you know, the villain of history, things like that, you know. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, a quick question for, uh, for Raja. How, how, do you, how do you see India in this whole equation, especially... Uh, in the Indo side of the Indo-Pacific region, uh, that there seems to be a lot of emphasis. Center of gravity seems to be more the Pacific side. How do you see the Quad as well, uh, India playing a role, coordinating between Quad and uh, the Quad and, and AUKUS um, for in the interest of the Indo side of the Indo-Pacific? No, just to start with the earlier uh, question, I mean, I think India is a classic example of pushback you know earlier we were talking yeah. about pushback right but india was sitting with the chinese uh, india wanted to work with the chinese to say look we'll build a multipolar world which meant limiting american power uh, we said you know we are asian brothers we have solidarity we are you know two great asian nations we should work to uh, promote uh, a different kind of world with the russian brothers now, having once China started pushing India, we've had conflicts in 2013, 2014, 2017, and 2020. The last crisis is still going on. Now, after the last crisis, India has moved decisively towards the United States, uh, shedding a whole lot of historic baggage that it is willing to work with uh, the United States to deal with the uh, Chinese challenge. So I think you push people, uh, they do things which they would have not uh, otherwise done. And I think Indian example stands out. Second, I think on the India and the Pacific, the reason for putting Indo into the Pacific is to broaden that framework in which we deal with the new challenge. Because otherwise, look, the US could have happily, it had Japan, Australia, or it's not treaty allies. Uh, there is a historic relationship there. If they wanted to just deal with the Pacific, uh, they would have just done strengthen the two alliances uh, and to keep uh, push ahead. But I think the need for an Indian component to this larger strategy is where the need for larger mass, the need to have another major Asian power join a coalition 
that is willing to challenge our Chinese unilateralism. Uh, it's, it's a political benefit. Second, I think the Quad, as we have seen, uh, has been to, uh, while well, AUKUS is focused on military, the Quad has moved towards a more public goods agenda on vaccine production, on 5G, on a whole range of issues. If you recall, again, it was India that spoke up against 5G, uh, against this belt. Uh, a large part of the criticism is now widely uh, widely endorsed. So, so I think having India, which is historically a partner of China, an Asian nation that historically opposed American military presence in this part of the world, working with the U.S., uh, produces a message, I think, fundamentally to the Chinese that, look, uh, that the, the coalition is not about uh, Asia versus the U.S., uh, it's not Asia for Asians, that unless the Chinese change their behavior towards their Asian neighbors, uh, many more Asian countries would want to align and get closer to the to the United States. So the uh, principal benefit is political. Second, uh, India has military capabilities. Now we can relieve the United States from some of its functions uh, in the Indian Ocean so that the U.S. can do more in the in the West, in the Western Pacific. India, Australia can do more in Eastern Indian Ocean. Where uh, you know, working around the Malacca Straits and the Sunda Lombok Straits, they can generate some uncertainty for the Chinese. So there is a military benefit of of cutting the burden, or the security burdens in a way that the U.S. can take on far more heavier responsibilities, while India can take more responsibilities in the in the Indian Ocean. Thank you, thank you, Raja. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, is there anyone among the youth who want to raise anyone who hasn't spoken yet? Uh, Omkar, Natalie, um, anyone who wants to say something? Yes, Omkar, go ahead, speak up. I can't hear you. Uh, am I audible, right? Yeah, uh, audible, but could you speak up louder, please? Uh, yes. So, yes. Uh, so, so my uh, point is that so China, as the, uh, all the honorable speakers have said, China has. Uh, realize that it has the potential, it has the capability to uh, change, to uh, change, uh, to change the geopolitics of the uh, not only not not only of Asia but also the world. So uh, it is this uh, newfound uh, uh, newfound what we can say enthusiasm, the newfound power that China wants to uh, uh, exercise itself on. So uh, and speaking from uh, like speaking about India. Uh, so India is the only uh, coordination which has its borders with China, and then uh, which is China, which China is threatening. And in the maritime region, the Indian Ocean. So the Indian Ocean, which historically had been uh, India's uh, what you can say stronghold, India's sphere of influence, is slowly but surely uh, getting uh, so is getting uh, diminished by Chinese power. So uh, it's. So it is like India is getting sandwiched between the in uh, in the maritime domain as well and in the continental the territorial domain as well. So as we as we saw the uh, the land border the uh, land border law that was passed uh, uh, that was passed yesterday and will be in effect from first uh, January 2022. So it clearly signals that China is also pushing back against these uh, initiatives. So for China, uh, like it has dismissed Quad as a Asian NATO and all those. Uh, adjectives that it has used, but China also has its own uh, uh, belief in its power that it can successfully push back against all the uh, formations that uh, that are taking place. And uh, China also sees that uh, the other major country that can threaten or will threaten at threaten its uh, rise in in the near future or in the coming decades will be mostly India, all from Japan, but uh, it it mostly will. Uh, it, Things that India will be uh, a threat to its uh, uh, so its power. So it is acting in the it is acting in, in its own uh, capabilities to stop India and to stop India and to project its power. Away. So that was right. the point. I, right. I Thank you. Make. Thank you very much, Omkar. Natalie, do you have a point? Do you have anything to add? Uh, well, first of all, thank you all very much for a very interesting and very um, enlightening and enriching discussion. And from from somebody from from Europe, I've, I'm from Greece. I've uh, studied in France. It's very. It's of course there are some hard realities to to grasp and to 
um, to process through the office deal and the way the whole um, the whole deal was uh, was signed and concluded. Um, but for me, the big question that is raised now is uh, is what Europe's and more specifically, of course, France's approach will be going forward. And of course, there were there were a lot of uh, rapid decisions which were taken, um, especially due to the fact that um, uh, a certain pride of a whole country was heard in the way the deal was uh, concluded. Um, of course, there are other there are other interests for the reason behind France's um, reaction. But it's very for me. It's it's going to be very interesting. For France to to remain engaged in the region, and of course, we will need to see what will happen with uh, the referendum that is coming from New Caledonia, and to see how things will develop from France's perspective, and um, just to see how how the the approach of being more engaged in the region from Europe and versus the the more um, security packs that are being concluded right now, how the balance between those two will play out. Right. Thank you, Natalie. And, and talking about France, uh, recently President uh, Macron seems to have uh, made an internal speech um, in France highlighting interest and determination to play a bigger role, for France to play a bigger role in in the Indo-Pacific, in particular the Pacific. Um, so, so here I have, to, I have a question, right? I mean, President Joe Biden's statement that AUKUS uh, reflects a broader trend of key European countries playing an extremely important role in the Indo-Pacific. He made this statement. Um, do you believe that this is what the countries in the region desire, right? Uh, countries like Japan, Taiwan, Singapore have pledged unequivocal support for AUKUS's expressed aim of contributing to the region. That's very clear. This could be attributed to some measure of familiarity and trust with the United States and to a lesser extent the Australia. However, this is the key question. This may not mean that the countries in the region, especially countries like Indonesia, countries like Malaysia, uh, and maybe even, uh, even the Philippines, welcome more European players getting involved in the region, you know, France and then and, and many others, countries who were who were colonial masters, countries who are not particularly welcome in the region. Uh, are, are the floodgates going to open for more and more of these players coming into the region? Is this what the countries in the region want? We have about three minutes left. Quick comments from one or two, one of one or two of you on the panel. Yeah, um, this is Francis. I just want to a quick comment, me? Francis. Okay. Yeah, I just want to express my, you know, gratitude on, you know, how this um, program went through. You know, it was a very interesting one and very loud and clear. But I want to also use this medium to, you know, tell the Oko's family to try as much as possible to, you know, put Africa in part of what they're doing because, you know, in terms of security, we really need, you know, we really need to... I understand. I understand that, Francis. That that. I understand. So we'll thank you. Forward, walk into us that. So thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Yeah. Is there anyone who would like to comment on the, the <laughs> point? <laughs> Yes, yes, Roger. I think uh, there is, you know, the, the colonial argument uh, no longer holds. I think uh, Europe has proved its uh, good citizenship. In fact, a recent uh, poll by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies uh, in Singapore showed the most trusted uh, two countries in this part of the world. One is Japan and the other is the European Union. So having the European Union uh, as a player on the European actors like Japan and Britain, I think gives more options to the to the Southeast Asians. Uh, and it's not then just US versus China, uh, which is what the Chinese argument has been, that having more actors, uh, we can spread the risk around. Uh, we can uh, create a framework uh, in which uh, we can construct a deterrence in a, in a much better way. Because really Japan's idea to draw Britain and later uh, France. So having France around, I think, is good. I think India will do its part to do more with France in this region. And uh, I don't think uh, ASEAN has any problems with a larger European role uh, in this part of the world. Thank you. Is there any other view on yes. this matter? Yeah, I want to say something. I want to appreciate everyone who has 
made contributions to expand frontiers of knowledge uh, in this uh, conference or what I call a seminar. I want to say that international relations is actually uh, economic interest, really. And whatever interest you are in, whatever platform alliance system that doesn't serve the interest of a particular state, they are free to leave and then look for a better one that will serve their interest. And so that is the case with focus. Uh, it will interest us to know that somehow as they go, even New Zealand indicated interest to tap into this, their willingness to look at cyber technology and to enhance their political and security and, uh, uh, and economic right. uh, interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other final points from my panelists, from the main panelists? Anyone? If not, I have, a, I have a final question for Manu. Manu, a quick comment on, are there yeah. any risks that you see that we all need to be aware of and be mindful of? Risks arising from AUKUS? Yes. Well, I, I think it's a Chinese miscalculation <laughs> that if the Chinese continue to believe that, uh, you know, the, the thing that the, the leaders have been repeating a lot that the east is rising and the west is declining if they misread that and they think that well they can do something along the lines of what drew mentioned you know take kinman or whatever and really change the whole picture i mean that would i think force the u.s to decide whether it needed to respond in kind and you could very rapidly get an escalation right excuse me can i, can I respond to mandur's opinion uh, who is this, please? Uh, this is Chao Ting speaking. Yes, Chao Ting. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Where are you so from, Chao Ting? Where are you from? Uh, I'm a Chinese. I live in Germany. All right, sure. Go ahead, please. Okay, so I don't agree with the argument that uh, it's Chinese miscalculation that um, Chinese China is rising and uh, the... Uh, Western powers uh, are declining. I don't think so. I think this is an uh, um, inevitable geopolitical competition between China and uh, the United States. So the U.S. is uh, a very powerful maritime power, and China is traditionally a land power. And uh, today we are talking about uh, AUKUS. Obviously, AUKUS is... Uh, a geostrategic alliance of maritime powers, UK, US, and Australia, all of them can be perceived as maritime powers. And um, uh, why do I argue that uh, AUKUS is a geostrategic alliance? Because uh, US has decided to share its uh, nuclear driving submarine technology to Australia. This is very certain. U U.S. has only shared this technology to U.K. Uh, in the past, okay? U.S. has never shared this top-secret uh, uh, technology with other uh, NATO airlines. So this is uh, evidence that uh, AUKUS is uh, a geostrategic airlines. But uh, who is the target of this geostrategic airlines? Of course, it's China. China is the elephant in the room. Uh, although Biden and uh, Prime Minister Morrison uh, and uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson have avoided uh, to name China directly, but everyone is clear here. China is the target of this geostrategic airlines. For me, it's nothing strange. This is just uh, the repeat of the geopolitical competition between land powers and uh, maritime and sea powers. This has uh, taken place in the history many times. For example, the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. It's typical geopolitical struggle between uh, maritime powers and land powers. The former Soviet Union is a land power and the US is a sea power. So today, China has uh, replaced the position of the former Soviet Union. China is also um, Eurasia land power. And uh, now, for the U.S., the very important 
geopolitical objective is that uh, U.S. will try everything and everything to avoid uh, any land power, any any land power which can unite the Eurasia continent. So it seems that China has a potential. So from my point of view, the geopolitical competition between U.S. and China is inevitable. This has always taken place in the history. And uh, of course, it's just one step of the U.S. grand strategy. We have right. seen other other uh, steps from the United States, like Quad. Okay, Quad is also one part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. AUKUS is, is one part of the Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So this is just a repeat of the historical geostrategic competition. This okay. is nothing strange. Right. Thank you very much, Shouting. Uh, it's 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 really good that. We've, we've heard, we have the benefit of hearing your perspective. Um, I, I think the whole point about IQ International is to, is to hear multiple perspectives and for the audience to decide from, for themselves what they want to, right? Uh, what's important is I don't think, I mean, from, from the conversations we are hearing so far, uh, I don't think that uh, this is anti-China. Okay, there could be threats that could be associated with China, but I do not think the general view held here is that these these measures are anti-China. Uh, if if China and and these alliances, including the USA, is prepared to come to the, the, the negotiating table and sit down and talk together with the other countries in the region, I think that would be the ideal, right? But as the, the, the operative word so far we've been hearing is balance of power balance of power a balance of power is going to be in the in the best in the benefit of of the countries in the region and for prosperity i think that's that's the general view uh, we don't have time to continue the discussion unfortunately uh, it leaves me now to thank my five panel speakers uh, drew thompson uh, raja mohan haley chana manu baskran and thank you. Uh, hu tiangbun as well as our youth speakers, Grace, Omka, Francis, Louis, and Natalie. And my special thanks to the rest of you for making time to join us. Um, these are clearly very troubled and troubling times, and, and on so many fronts, least of all because of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we, we are seeing the best and the worst in people and countries. There are already enough tensions and issues between countries, between countries, as people like Manu have highlighted in the Indo-Pacific as a whole, and within subgroupings such as ASEAN and SARC countries in South Asia. It gets complicated when new players from outside of the region seek to exert influence or power. It does, right? This makes it difficult for countries in the region to sort things out because confrontations could happen, timelines could get shrunk, and options get limited. The general view expressed in this discussion is that AUKUS is a net positive for the region as it, together with the Quad and other alliances, helped to prevent unilateralism and expansionism in the region. It, it helps to foster a better balance of power in the region, which in the end is going to be good for the countries in the region, which includes China as well, right? Yet, the caution here is this, even with the best of intentions, actions by large powers or alliances, whether in the region or from outside, can have negative consequences if signals get crossed. This is especially when countries in the region don't feel consulted and larger regional powers feel confronted. Hence, the timely emphasis on respecting ASEAN centrality. This is why sharing and discussion are important before major initiatives are announced, especially security initiatives. It's inclusive, it's less threatening, and reduces room for speculation. It's about building trust as a long-term good, continued engagement. After all, this is what friends and partners do. This was Inconvenient Questions, where ideas awaken.